uh, let's get going. It's uh, a lot to talk about as usual. Um, now, apparently, Google, in wanting to get its next generation of AI chips, uh, is using AI to design them much more quickly than humans can. That's our top news story. Um, and I'm not sure what this is all about in technology, and Richard can talk more about it, but apparently your brain will have a hard time processing a self-balancing electric bicycle when it's moving. What is this? And in materials and graphene, once again, graphene though, and this is unusual, can be used to detect COVID-19, both quickly and accurately. Wow. And in flight and space, it's under China again, and they have a space dream, a long march to the moon and beyond, and with three astronauts now into space. In the environment, and we were talking about this uh, before the session began, but the Western United States is getting braced for a record heat wave. In biology, I don't know if any of you have met any naked mole rats, but apparently they might hold the key to curing cancer and dementia. And, and this could relate a little bit to our last story about the aging process. For humans, apparently, if you want a good diagnosis, it's better to be nice. Rudeness impairs the doctor's decision making. And for our health, uh, health and medical thing, as I said before, the aging process is what we're talking about. But what this report says is the aging process is apparently unstoppable because we've received a lot of other things recently to think that maybe we can deal with it. This says no. So, Richard, what's this in our top story? that says Google is using AI to de design its next generation of AI chips, and it can do it much more quickly using AI than humans can do it. Now, the reason why uh, this, I thought, was the top story is that uh, for years, uh, computer scientists and people who are looking at computers have been forecasting what they call the singularity. And by this, they mean the time when basically computers become smarter than human beings. And uh, I see this story as directly fitting into that and leading us towards the singularity. Uh, it turns out Google for uh, several years has been uh, working on how to use machine learning to be able to design chips, to design ICs. And now uh, for uh, the first time, they are using uh, this research to apply it to a commercial product, one that they're actually going to release and uh, offer for sale. And this commercial product is Google's own uh, tensor processing unit. And these chips are optimized for AI computations. So Google is using machine learning to help design the next generation of machine learning chips. And these algorithms designs are equal or superior to those created by humans. And instead of months, it takes six hours to do this part of uh, the design. So AI is accelerating the future of AI development. And, you know, this has a big implication for the chip industry. And one of the things is it also has a big implication. There's a, 
enormous part of the chip industry is making custom chips and these custom chips will happen much faster. Now the specific thing Google was using their AI for is a part of the chip design which is known as floor planning and this is where you figure out where the chip subsystems are and how they'll connect. These are the central processing units, the graphic processing units, and memory cores. And all of these things, uh, when the chip is there, are connected together by tens of kilometers of wiring, of micro wiring on the chip. So it's a real complicated thing. And even though the chip is tiny, it has miles of wiring within it connecting it. As part of this process, the uh, engineers train this AI system with a data set of 10,000 chips that had different qualities of floor plans. Then it taught that chip using different metrics like the length of wire of connections and the power usage of the chip to evaluate the chip for whether it was a good layout or a bad layout and learn to do that. And having learned to do that, then it can lay out this stuff. And once you have this general floor plan laid out, the rest of it, there are automated uh, layout tools that can do the rest of the work very quickly that are being used uh, today in existing des designs. Uh, one thing about the chip, though, is you can tell by looking <laughs> at the chip and the layout of the chip, whether it was done by a human being or uh, one of these AI algorithms. If a human lays out chips, things tend to be in neat little roll rows and things like this because human minds organize things like that and having things laid out in some orderly <laughs> fashion makes sense to people. The AIs don't think like that, of course, and then they have things that look like it's almost <laughs> at random. Uh, but here they are. They can do it faster and probably better than people. And uh, this process is accelerating the future of AI development and brings the uh, singularity even closer. Now, of course, this is not the only way they're using in computers and designing chips. And Google itself is uh, using AI chips and other part of the chips to design, to explore different architectures and things like this. And NVIDIA, who is very big in these AI chips, is using uh, AI to try to figure out how to speed the workflow through their chips. So in terms of designing chips, AI design, chip designers is something that is only getting started. So welcome to the singularity, folks. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I was wondering, aren't we uh, afraid that we worried about start? this? losing control over over development and uh, find ourselves uh, you know having to fight off uh, you know, these these chips yes we're losing control and that's the whole purpose of it because when we control it and do all of these things in the way our puny minds can do it it's just too slow yeah, yeah. i've always uh, understood that problems, some problems you can only solve by try every possibility and then evaluate right. the results. And this is what computers are very good at because they can work quickly. So this is really just a build on that, if I am reading it right. <laughs> I think so. I have a friend. I have a friend who's convinced that eventually computers, AI is going to overtake human beings. 
Sure. Now maybe I'm on maybe I'm on Mount Stupid, but no. I just I just think human being I think human beings are going to wipe out human beings well before that ever happens. Well, <laughs> what I uh, read about five years ago in the early times of doing these hot science presentations was at that time they thought that the computer that was going to be as smart as a human being that you could put in a box and sell for a thousand dollars was uh maybe 20 years away now it would be 15 years away and that uh wait for this part in another 10 years because of the increased ability to the ai to make ai smarter then you would be able for the thousand dollars to buy a box that has the intelligence of every human being on the planet. Of course, then you insert a bug that tells the AI to to take charge over human beings. And actually, and my friend, I mean, he's a really smart guy, he's a bit of an odd bird, but he's very smart. And actually, when now that I think about it, that seems quite conceivable that all you got to do is put in that bug that says take over human beings and whatever it takes and then it's i guess it is kind of conceivable well you don't have to tell it to take over human beings you just have to tell it to optimize the process and it will turn out human beings are too slow yeah <laughs> or the, the order could be wipe out human beings <laughs> No, you want the system to configure it out to do that for itself. Yeah. Well, criminals, criminals. And what people mean when they talk about intelligence. Like, it's one thing for me to make an estimate of how big something is. It's another thing for me to solve a quadratic equation. There are so many different things that are make up intelligence. In some of these things, AI is much smarter than me right now. And, and some other species are much better at estimating distances. Certainly birds can do that much more. So um, I, I think we are, there are so many different things that make up intelligence. And some computers are already far more, and some things, but to do all of the whole, all of that stuff, uh, d depends on how you set it up, how you measure it, and so on. So, I don't know exactly what it would mean to say that they're more or less intelligent. <laughs> well, I I have a slam. I I'm a little skeptical about AI because I think, like Fred says, part of intelligence is also emotional intelligence. It's almost irrational intuition. A lot of the greatest ideas have come as pure intuition, or because of emotional sensitivity to things. And I'm not sure computers can replicate that. I'm, I'm not positive that that part of the human con, human uh, mind is uh, replicable technologically. But logic, yeah, pure logic, it can leave us in the dust. But also mm -hmm. intuition, uh, they've tried to understand what intuition is. And some people think that intuition is being able to you know, kind of feel these patterns that uh, you kind of understand, but it's below the level of cognition. And in terms of pattern detection, AIs often are much better at that than people are. So I don't know if that is intelligence or intuition or whatever, but it just is to me it's an interesting problem and you know talking about what is intelligence of course is uh very appropriate here yeah and to that point you can you can uh program computers to read emotional uh, uh expressions on people's faces which is certainly up they're part doing of it now they're doing it now <laughs> They're doing it now, absolutely. And they want to be able to do it so that they can see your pupils expand when you see the ad on your computer screen so they know that they can sell you that. Yeah, and if you buy an artificial friend, you want your artificial friend to be empathic. That's right. And, and, and yeah. yeah. Some of my best ideas 
come about as a result of me being lazy. And I can't imagine that you could build laziness into a computer. <laughs> well, you're lazy could... and then you're ruminating when you're lazy. We can build a ruminating subroutine. <laughs> yeah. Right. I've heard writers and comedians talk about they need to just crash and lie down and do absolutely nothing. And <laughs> sure. your friends look at them like they're lazy, but they're, they, they've learned that that's what they need to do. They need to shut down so that they can come to some great ideas, writing or stories or comedy or whatever. Sometimes when I was dealing with problems working uh, in the semiconductor industry, what I found I needed to do was to go pull weeds. Yeah. <laughs> this is smokable. Yes. What's this about self-balancing electric bikes and your brain having a hard time processing what they do? What's that? I'm I'm not sure what the brain processing part of it has to do except attracting eyeballs to the articles. Uh, here I have a video and we're seeing uh, the bicycle go forward, go backward. Uh, we're seeing it go around an object. And uh, we're seeing it also, it doesn't look like a very classic uh, pretty bike. It has all kind of crap hanging off on it and stuff like that. So uh, they haven't done the, uh, ergonomic design to make it uh, pretty for consumers yet. But, uh, you know, this uh, bike that if you look at it is not pretty, it looks like a research project. Uh, it turns out one of the things about this bike is it was created single handedly by one hardware engineer in China, Zi Hui Jung, who uh, did this project in his spare time. And so the bicycle is uh, self-balancing and it's achieved through a perpendicularly mounted heavy metal wheel that can quickly change direction uh, to uh, deal, to generate this kind of angular momentum like your wheels generate when they're going around that keeps the bicycle upright and keeps it from falling over. It's controlled by an accelerometer and gyroscopic sensors that detect even the smallest, smallest motion. When you see it, they're self-balancing. It looks rock solid, uh, but there are constant <clears throat> adjustments being made by it. And they say it should work whether there's a writer on the back or not. I don't trust this. It should work with a writer on it. I would mm -hmm. trust it better if I saw the writer. But there's another interesting thing about this uh, bike, another interesting application for it, uh, which is to quickly deliver packages in the crowded streets in cities like they have in China. Uh, the engineer did an upgrade for this and added RGB death sensing camera and a LIDAR sensor like you hear about with cars that allows it not only to ride by itself, but also avoid obstacles and navigate traffic. And this bike could easily replace the cars that are used by services like Uber Eats to deliver orders. And uh, Uber is not the only company, of course, delivering orders in urban environments. Any of the drugstores or things like this could use them. And uh, because this bike is uh, a bike, not a car, it can zip through traffic when traffic is stuck going between the cars and even take advantage of shortcuts that cars never could. And so uh, it looks like 
electric lights are now uh, have uh, what's coming next are autonomous self-balancing electric bikes. <laughs> when you go around the corner on a bike, you have to lean over slightly. So, yes. uh, can, so can the machine do that? Of course, it has it has this uh, central rotating flywheel that it adjusts the angular momentum, which will lean the bike over and make it stable. Mm. How about if it runs into a pothole? Uh, like in Mexico, I don't know what it's like on cobbles. Why wouldn't drones be better than this? Uh, because drones are in the air and a bunch of traffic. It's another alternative to drones. It might be cheaper than drones. It, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, certainly, uh, drones as a delivery item might be better, but uh, to have it be your uh, automatic autonomous bicycle that rides you through traffic while you're reading the newspaper this will do better oh no and and drones take a lot of energy right uh, for, for the weight carried this could deliver heavier things right more economically than a drone but a drone would be better for envelopes or prescriptions or lightweight thing you know i wonder why they uh the uh, size of the bike uh, like any other bike. I mean, if it's going to be used autonomous, then uh, wouldn't it be easier if they would make the thing, give it a much lower profile? I mean, well, that right. would help also if yeah, you, the balancing brake. If you are designing your delivery vehicle, uh, certainly having it smaller might make good sense. Uh, if you're designing it to have people riding it, it's uh, not a bad s size. The other thing is what this guy did is he went somewhere and got a bike and added a bunch of hardware to it and computers to it. So he started with what he could find, which was a bicycle. <laughs> you know, so this is just rev one of uh, the electric autonomous self-balancing bicycle. Well, this week is that it can be used to detect COVID-19. What's that about? Well, you know that uh, I have been talking about COVID or COVID, excuse me. I've been talking about graphene as the miracle material, and most weeks I've had some new amazing use of it. And this week it moves into biology and medicine, which I never had thought that we would be talking about graphene in. And the University of Illinois Chicago has been uh, developing graphene sensors for a number of years and they must have gotten on this at the very beginning because graphene has only been known for about 10 years so if they've been doing it for many years they must have started at the very beginning and uh, basically uh, what they're doing is they're taking sheets of graphene and then uh, adding a uh, ant layer of antibodies that are designed to target uh, COVID-19. And then they find out they're doing uh, tests of the vibrations and resonance on the graphene, which apparently you can measure easily. I don't know how you do it, but they say you can do it easily. And uh, what they see 
with these uh, graphene sheets with the layers of antibodies is the resonant pattern of the graphene is different if it has uh, uh, COVID on it than it is if it doesn't have COVID on it. And it turns out it's sensitive enough and specific enough where it reacts to COVID-19, but not to other uh, coronaviruses like the Middle East Respiratory System known as MERS COV. And so it's very specific. And uh, again, it's all done by the vibration of the antibody coupled graphene uh, when treated with COVID. It, resonance different. The test is fast. It's under five minutes. And uh, this uh, sensor will end up being cheap and quick. And uh, what I believe also is that it will open up the door to uh, other kinds of easy ways to be able to uh, quickly and cheaply uh, identify other viruses. It's very specific. I guess you'd have to have a different sheet of uh, graphene for the different viruses that you're looking for because one component of it is the graphene plus some antibody that reacts. But uh, it is certainly interesting and you know, the graphene, when you make the sheets of graphene, uh, because of the orderly position, there is just a routine kind of uh, resonance that they can measure of the electrons. And that pattern is sensitive enough where putting something else on the service creates a different resonance. And uh, viruses have their own individual resonant patterns. Mm. So, Richard, do they have, uh, have they compared the sensitivity of this to the standard PCR testing, which is being used for diagnosis? I don't know. They didn't talk about it at all, but they were very positive that they were identifying COVID-19 and, for example, not identifying uh, MERS. So, you know, one will get a positive and a close relative will not. So I think that's, that is pretty encouraging. It's a good product for the vaccine deniers. They can keep it at home and if they get a single, <laughs> start consuming the hydrochloroquine and uh, ivermectin and all the other stuff. Okay, that's right. So if you get a positive test, you're supposed to drink bleach. <laughs> Kind of space dream. What are they trying to do? Well, uh, China, we haven't, they're kind of behind uh, the US and Russia, but China has been spending big money on space exploration and uh, they have come a long way to catching up to the US and Russia. If you look at China's space program, back when Sputnik was launched in 1957, Mao Zedong said, we too will make satellites. It took them a while, but in 1970, more than a decade later, China launched its first satellite. Man space flight took a while longer they launched their first uh, Chinese astronaut in 2003. And since then, they've launched uh, a total of six crewed uh, missions. This launch of three astronauts into the satellite that uh, they are assembling modules of is the biggest launch that they've ever made. And these will be the longest people have been in space 
the Chinese have been in space. And then, of course, you know, China is planning to build a base on the moon and they uh, plan a crewed lunar mission uh, th by the end of the decade. And uh, the Chinese space station, uh, given a name which translates to Heavenly Palace, uh, will be up and completed in orbit next year. And when it's in orbit, it's uh, about 250 miles out of the atmosphere and uh, will remain in orbit for at least 10 years. So uh, it's the beginning uh, of a long-term Chinese human presence in space. So that's what they're up to. And it looks like we have... Not so well, we should be. On my system, your voice is discontinuous, Fred. Uh, Fred is frozen? No, here. We, we're here, John. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so what are you guys, are you going to go to space in a Chinese spaceship? You know, Jeff Bezos is uh, going into, into space this week in his rocket, and there is a part petition with tens of thousands of signatures that asks him to stay in space, to don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, I, just I, I, I mean, really, the chances that he'll die is probably 3%. It's like the stupidest thing the richest man in the world could possibly do is do this. What do you think? What, about 3 to 5% chance that he dies? Oh, doing something this? like that, probably. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't like those odds. A lot worse than getting COVID. Yes. And, he's taking, yeah. and he's taking his brother with him too. <laughs> he's taking his brother and some other guy paid $28 million for the empty to ride along as well. I'm guessing everybody has a friend who's wealthy and, 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 and fly, flew a single engine plane into a mountain. I, I know I have a physician, a very well-known physician in Cincinnati that did that. Uh, again, hubris, uh, false confidence, uh, it's stupid, but whatever. I mean, he's having fun. Good for him. <laughs> That's right. And maybe look on the bright side. Maybe it will explode and he won't come back. Yeah, no, that money will hopefully be, uh, you know, like what his, his ex-wife is doing is just donating a whole lot of money to some wonderful causes. It's, it's actually, divorce is a beautiful thing. <laughs> People are funny is all I can say. You know, they, they, the person we visited in Seattle or every uh, Oak Harbor, he, for, just for fun, likes to jump out of plane. Yeah. And then he says, in, he, they in reach speed, and they okay, reach we're speed moving of, along. Okay. The West having a record heat wave coming along. What now, the, there are a couple of reasons why I had this story. One of them is uh, this is one of the kinds of stories that we're going to be seeing for the rest of this century, which is uh, funny weather phenomena that are causing uh, new kind of problems uh, with the environment. And the other reason I had this story is again, some other story I read several years ago that said 
that there's a high probability this century that the West, meaning the area that is affected now with this heat wave, will have a drought condition go on worse than anything that has ever been seen in the West before and last for about 40 years was the prediction. So now we have this story showing, saying Western U.S. braced for record heat wave. And this is, uh, it looks like affecting 50 million Americans who are on heat wave for excessive temperatures, which could approach 120 degrees or 50 C. And so Right now, average temperatures uh, in the West are about 20 degrees Fahrenheit above the seasonal high. And places like Las Vegas, Las Vegas has had a uh, drought and heat wave since the summer of 2013. And uh, the uh, heat wave, they have the fear that the heat wave starting so early this year could lead to another year of terrible, deadly forest fires. Now, 88% uh, of the Western region is currently in a state of drought. That includes all of California, Oregon, Utah, and Nevada, and a bunch of neighboring areas where they don't have the whole state. And so uh, my fear is maybe this is an early sign of the 40-year drought that we have coming in the West. Welcome to the days of climate change, folks. Oh, fake news. <laughs> it's just it's just a cycle. That's right. It is it is horrific. It really is. It's terrifying. Honest to God. Well, the associated story we had last week was the carbon level in the atmosphere is higher than it's been in the last four million years. It's just a cycle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I really want to ask us straw get a straw poll going because you hear my gloom and doom. Honest to goodness, do people believe that we will reach some apocalyptic event? If so, approximately when? I, and I'll go first. I think 50-50 that it will occur within 30 years. Seriously. I mean, Richard, sure. what do you think? Well, I think uh, it is very likely, I think we're going to still pull uh, enough rabbits out of our hat to avoid the worst of it. Uh, we're certainly going to have to figure out how to adapt and do things that we haven't done. And on the way, I think uh, it's going to be disaster after disaster. But well, my, again, to sum up, what I'm saying is climate change, climate refugees, the rise of illiberal democracies, using up our resources, we're killing the oceans, and all of these feed on each other. Yes. And therefore, I conclude that it is at least 50-50 that within 30 years, sure. uh, and, and cyber terrorism, and on and on and on. So so uh, can I just go around the room real just sort of a quick, uh, Fred, what do you think? Can't hear you. Just put a thumbs up or thumbs down, Fred. Thumbs up, does that mean Me? we're gonna survive? Or thumbs down means, thumbs up means we're gonna have trouble. Okay, all right, VJ, what do you think? VJ's with me, okay, Clive? Yeah. <laughs> you're with me, John? Uh, I think you're probably right, uh, uh, at least a great part of the, of the population is not going to be able to, to survive. Uh, some part, the ones with the, that has the money and the power, will probably be able to uh, 
because we've got uh, potable water and need it and that sort of thing. And I have a feeling that uh, humanity will move on the ground, you know, and, uh, and of course our uh, conversion plants that uh, can be erected along the oceans and clean the water and, uh, and get uh, drinkable water. But, uh, you know, I uh, found a friend of my long past now, Ralph Peck, uh, put the first couple of them in, um, in Israel. So it's not exactly new technology. But, uh, but I think those countries without the money and the wherewithal uh, are going to be uh, the hardest hit uh, unless they start fighting, you know, for the, to, to get their way. But I, I doubt it. I think okay. I, I think you're right, Cliff. Uh, that uh, you know the future doesn't look very bright. Now, uh, what Andrew? I what I have thought uh, for some times is we have what the engineers call a race condition, uh, where we have uh, the technology and things that can provide. Uh, the kind of relief we need to ameliorate the process anyway, racing against the timeline of destruction, and it's not clear who's going to win. Well, I just, the problem I see is the death of journalism and truth and facts and science, and uh, that's a brutal combination. Andrew, you but want to all of think? that stuff uh, hasn't slowed down. For example, uh, the elimination of coal and the reduction of oil for the use of energy around the world, and so uh, that uh, I think train has lost left the station and wind power and solar power have are successful now they're cheaper in most places of the world and all the new construction is going on using this new technology and well, so, I, I agree with you about energy i think we're going to we're solving energy but i just think everything else well, is, is overwhelming well is overwhelming there, that. if you break it into problems what you have to do, energy is about 40% of the problem. Then farming is about a third of the problem. And it's going to be hard to, de that's one that is harder to deal with. The other part of the problem ends up being essentially industry production, making cement, making steel, stuff like that. And those are all harder to deal with. So some of the problems we're making headway with some of the problems are tough changing how people farm around the planet for example is a tough job yeah and i'd agree with cliff too that uh, this climate change is uh, coming regardless and uh just the uh, real problem are going to be climate refugees and uh all that uh, stuff sure. that are just <clears throat> insolvable problems. Yeah. I, I think there will be enclaves of people that will survive, but it's very hard to predict where those enclaves will be. Right. I'm just, I'm just, call, I'm just saying the likelihood of sort of a real apocalyptic thing to where we will get to that enclave. So it's, yeah, that will happen uh, eventually, whether it's 20 years or 500 years or 50 years. <laughs> And that that'll be a whole different thing that'll spin out. But I'm I'm just talking about the event where life as we know it, with nation states and organized as they are in the United Nations and all that, just be, we turn into just tribes. Uh, that sort of event, because that's what I think is going to happen. It'll probably over the course of ten years or something like that. That'll something like that'll be really a big obvious blip from somebody above the canopy looking from from outer space. Yeah, I wonder if this, this condition has happened before. Uh, the reason that I, I heard, and I am uh, a little vague on that, but it was just recently uh, about a, a Turkish guy who went, uh, he, he was doing something on the basement of his house and uh, broke to a wall and by, by accident got into a tunnel and that tunnel led to uh, a city underground and at one time it housed some 20,000 people, I guess. Did anybody hear about that? No. 
There are places in Turkey where people have lived underground for thousands of years. Yeah, right. Well, this obviously was one of those one of those places. So that's why I was wondering it might have happened before in other places of the world. Who knows? And the other thing that supports uh, Cliff's uh, um, predictions are that things tend to grow exponentially and then they collapse. And our population has been growing exponentially for the last couple of hundred. Uh, there's a whole part of mathematics around it called catastrophe theory. Right. Yeah. Right. I hate to point out Martin Seligman's an expert on cognitive psychology. And he did a study on comparing optimists and pessimists. And when he looked at optimists, they did a study where how they, they did a presentation and they asked the optimists how they did and they grossly overestimated how good they were when the pessimists were happy for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Now, uh, Whole different if question. You're, if you're not sure of all this, the next story says, could naked, uh, naked mole rats hold the key to everything? Maybe not climate change, but how about cancer and dementia? They probably have the answer to climate change too. They all live underground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, the uh, naked mole rats are interesting. Uh, you know, other small uh, rodents typically live maybe two years like mice and rats. Mole rats live 40 or 50 years. And the scientists have tried to understand the difference and they found mole rats have uh, something unique in the animal kingdom, which is they have a system that repairs their DNA and uh, repairing their DNA, it looks like in mole rat prevents cancers and other degenerative conditions, including dementia. And so what they're trying to do is to understand what makes the mole rat system works like that. And if they're able to figure out of uh, this DNA repair process, uh, then it looks like that stands a chance as being a powerful tool against cancer. Mole rats don't get cancer and also dementia. Mole rats don't get dementia either, but I don't know how they tell, uh, do a mental test on a mole rat to see if he has dementia. Uh, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but also mole rats, when they live in the wild, they live in hierarchical communities that are run by a queen. So the queen mole rat rules the roost, and I don't, I suspect that doesn't have anything to do with them living so long but it's uh, just an amusing factoid. So mole rats may be, uh, provide us with a key to longer life until the catastrophe. It also on the right, the advantages of nudity, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> they should check nudist colonies. Maybe they yeah. live longer too. I don't think I don't think it was the naked as much as the mole rat. Is <laughs> a very actually what they do for dimension mole rats. I just read this recently. They give them a very simple quadratic equation, and then it's just time. <laughs> and it's a simple, it's the simplest test. If it's ten seconds, twenty seconds. And it's 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 pretty much time proven uh, technique. <laughs> the other thing they don't say is what mole rats die from if they don't die from cancer or these other things, like uh, what gets them after fifty years. Well, mm -hmm. age. There are other aging mechanisms besides oh. the breakdown yeah. of the system. Boredom. <laughs> boredom. Yeah, they die of boredom. <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> now, Richard, in the next story, uh, 
if we're talking about cancer and dementia, and if you want a good medical diagnosis around it, apparently you should be nice. That if you want a good decision making from the doctor, don't be rude. What's that about? Now, these behavioral scientists have uh, done uh, a lot of work that's interesting. And they're saying, you know, have you ever been cut off in traffic by another driver, which leaves you just seething inside for a while or in a meeting interrupted by a colleague and found yourself replaying that event in your head uh, even after you've left work for the day. And minor rude like events like this happen all the time and you would be surprised at the effect they have on the people. So uh, a research was done by uh, people at the University of Maryland's uh, School of Business on this. And they found that sometimes this kind of incidental rudeness can be deadly. Uh, they, in researching this, one of the things that they identified is something that is called anchoring bias. And the anchoring bias is the tendency to be fixated on one piece of information when you're making a decision, even if that piece of information uh, is not uh, relevant. And uh, it's very common, they say, in medical diagnosis. For example, if you go to the doctor and say, I think I'm having a heart attack. Help me, doctor, that this can become an anchor and the doctor may get fixated on the diagnosis of a heart attack, even though you're just having indigestion. And uh, if doctors don't move off anchors enough, they start treating the wrong thing. And so they did a study using uh, anesthesiology residents and giving them a medical problem. And before the, the simulation started, they were given an incorrect suggestion about the patient's condition. And this suggestion served as an anchor. And what they found out is then in that, if the uh, resident experienced rudeness prior to the time the simulation started, they kept on treating the wrong thing, even in the presence of consistent information that it was really something else that was the problem. And so these are uh, anesthesiologist residents. So they're not doctors yet, but they are well on their way. And they found experiencing rudeness makes it much more likely that a person will get anchored on the first suggestion they have. And uh, this turns out there are some situations where this really is a problem like medical diagnosis. You want the guy to be thinking well and looking at different solutions and not getting stuck on one particular approach. They did find, as they were continuing to research, that there were a couple of things that would help people expand their perspective. Being limited uh, to this anchor restricts your perspective. And so they wanted to see what can we do that expands their perspective. And uh, one of those was perspective taking, getting pr big picture perspective on the situation. And the other was information elaboration. So learning more about the situation and getting more information helped to get uh, the people unstuck. 
and so they found that both of these behaviors could counter affect the effects of rudeness on the anchoring and so again the message I have is when you go to the doctor and ask him for a diagnosis be nice <laughs> so he can approach it with an open mind yeah. the, the other thing that they point out is not only the patient has to be nice everybody has to be nice to the doctor because if the janitor right. is rude to him that will uh, put him off Right, but uh, that's where artificial intelligence is going to really make a difference in <laughs> things like uh, diagnoses and similar yes. situations. But yes. there's a really yeah. good book on anchoring and the like uh, by Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, and it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. And you may have heard of it, but you know it was 15 years ago the book. But he mm -hmm. talks about he and his uh, research partner uh, did a lot of work in the, from the 1970s on in this concept of biases and anchoring and all that stuff. But uh, everyone should uh, read this Thinking Fast and Slow and have your kids read it too because uh, we're all prone to making poor decisions when we think fast. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think it's just a, it's communication skills. Like I've just been to the doctor with a complaint on my skin. And what you do in the day, in these days of uh, phone consultations is you have to send a pic, you know, you have to send a picture of your skin complaint to the doctor. So besides the skin, I did a full write up on Every, everything that I would consider relevant. And I think that really helped the doctor. Yesterday I went and had this thing removed and, um, you know, it's going to be bio, it's going to have a biopsy. And uh, I think the communication really worked. Yes. <laughs> There's another a book that I highly recommend. I, the the, the Cotterman book is Thinking Fast Slow is, is legendary. There's another book that was a bestseller by Dan O'Reilly, who's a, another uh, really well-known writer, Israeli uh, psychologist. I think he was at Duke for many years. He had like 70% burns over most of his body, went through 30 surgical procedures. But anyway, he's gone on to be a, a best-selling writer. But his book, Predictably Irrational, is very entertaining. But I remember he talked about anchoring an experiment where William Sonoma couldn't sell their bread maker that was selling for like 400 bucks. So they figured out they needed to sell another one for $500. Uh, Cause then people, <laughs> that, that was, that was, then they started flying the $400 one flew off the shelf because people need some sort of anchoring mechanism to know what things are worth. And if they just see one out of it, they don't know if they're getting a deal, but once they see another one, that's, 50% more expensive, then they can, then they have some assessment of, of value. Yeah. Well, Richard, if we want to move on to our last story, what's this that is against all that we've been reading the last while saying we can't prevent uh, aging, but it's apparently unstoppable. What's that? Now, uh, as I read the story, uh, I, I personally believe uh, I don't come necessarily to the same conclusion that uh, the people did in the study, but the basis for their study was very good. You know, we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on anti-aging research and anti-aging products where we're trying to harness the power of genomics and artificial intelligence to find a way to e prevent or even reverse aging. And uh, this study uh, says, they're saying that uh, we cannot really slow the rate at which we get older because of biological constraints. And what they did uh, is they uh, studied not just the mortality of 
people, but the general pattern of mortality among humans and primates and uh, other closely related animals and found with all of them, humans and non-human patterns, that the general pattern of mortality was the same in all of these species where there's a high risk of early death and uh, then as the general conditions improved, then there is this uh, pattern of lower mortality. Uh, but with all of them, uh, none of them, no, none of these primates, even in the best of the environments, uh, the oldest of them were not any older. And so their study, they say, this study suggests that evolutionary biology trumps everything. And so far, medical advances have been unable to beat these biological constraints. So they're saying if you look at the biology of humans, primates, and related species, they all show the same kind of pattern for lifespan and uh, we're not going to be able to beat those biological patterns. There, however, are uh, aging researches going on around the world where that are being financed by people like Peter Thiel who have as an objective to extend their lifetime to the point where medicine is advanced enough to roll back aging. Uh, nobody knows if this can be done. These people are saying uh, it may not be likely and whatever is going to happen, you're still going to die. So we'll see. All of us get to see this. <laughs> yeah. Any thoughts? Well, if you look at the bottom of that article, there's all kinds of other links to other articles that talk about pills that are going to uh, spell the end of aging. So right. you, you can pretty much find out whatever you'd like to uh, read about uh, in The Guardian. Sure. <laughs> and uh, again, there are uh, the developing and researching these pills that you're talking about is uh, a multi-billion dollar proposition now because the drug companies are spending big money on this. We have populations getting older around the planet. And if we could just sell them all a couple of pills every day, uh, imagine what that does for our bottom line. Mm -hmm. No, but if we are going to be an extinct species, it doesn't matter how many of those pills you take. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, what mm -hmm. I want is to have a good quality of life until I become extinct. Good, good, good plan. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, well, I was Richard, just, thanks a lot. Go ahead, Clive. No, I was just going to say, I would, uh, the age of the people in this group, I, I imagine we're all taking something and if we wasn't taking it, we might have been dead by now. So, you know, so far, so good, and we're, we're winning the battle. <laughs> That's right. I was wondering. I was winning wondering. is not the right word. <laughs> Postponing, maybe. <laughs> what, what were you wondering, Cliff? I, I was wondering if our life expectancy goes like 150 years, then if you kill somebody, does the penalty... Uh, get worse like we go back to tarring and feathering people in a stadium or <laughs> I mean really if you, it, it's just if your life expectancy is much longer then the value of a life goes much higher and committing crimes felonies murdering someone becomes a much you know I'm against the death penalty but it does it makes me wonder about the implications <laughs> well Richard thanks a lot for all of this um 
and, and uh, I hope uh, that all of you get good medical diagnosis by being nice. And, okay. In other words, don't tell your doctor, week. hey, asshole, I'm having a heart attack. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> See you all Bye next week. It was a good session. I would like to. Adios. Adios.